Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the second quarter of 2022. Welcome to Lesson 1 from the series on Genesis, titled The Creation. This lesson is ready for teaching on April 2, and my name's Percy Harold. So, as we begin this quarter's series of lessons, let's read the two-page introduction by the author, Dr. Jacques B. Ducan, who is Emeritus Professor of Hebrew and Old Testament Exegesis at the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary at Andrews University. It's titled, The Book of the Beginning. Genesis is about Jesus. Jesus our Creator, Jesus our Sustainer, Jesus our Redeemer. Writing millennia after the Genesis text itself had been penned by Moses and reaching back across those ages to the patriarch's very words, the Apostle John reveals Jesus in the creation account in John chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. What did John write here? In the beginning, all things that were made, all things that once didn't exist, came into existence by Jesus. All creation from galaxies hurtling across the cosmos in staggering pinwheels of fire and light to the meticulous DNA woven miraculously into the cell to quantum waves, Jesus created and sustains it all. And the book of Genesis is the first story in Scripture of both this creation and the redemption of this creation. Here in this book is the world's only official account of all origins. The English word Genesis is derived from the Greek Genesis, which means beginning, itself derived from the Hebrew Bereshit, in the beginning, the first word of the book, hence the first word of the entire Bible. Christ gives us the foundation, the base upon which all the following scriptures rest. Because it is first and so foundational to all that comes after, Genesis is probably the most quoted or referred to book in the rest of scriptures. Genesis is important because it is the book that, more than any other work anywhere, helps us understand just who we are as human beings, a truth especially important now, in a day when we humans are deemed as nothing but accidents, chance creations of a purely materialistic universe. Or, as one physicist put it, we humans are organised mud, which is to some degree true, though for him the laws of nature alone organised it. Genesis, however, reveals to us our true origin, that we were beings purposely and perfectly made in the image of God in a perfect world. Genesis also explains the fall, that is, why our world is no longer perfect and why we as humans aren't as well. Genesis, however, also comforts us with God's promise of salvation in a world that, in and of itself, offers us nothing but suffering and death. With its dramatic stories of miracles, creation, births, the rainbow and judgments, the flood, Sodom and Gomorrah, witnessing to God's holy presence, Genesis is awe-inspiring. But, Genesis also is a book with moving human stories of love, Jacob and Rachel, or hatred, Jacob and Esau, or of birth, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob's sons, of death, Sarah, Rachel, Jacob, Joseph, of murder, Cain, Simeon and Levi, and forgiveness, Esau and Jacob, Joseph and his brothers. It also is an instruction book with lessons on ethics, with Cain and Babel, on faith with Abraham and Job, and on the hope and promise of redemption, the crushing of the serpent, the promised land. During this quarter, not only will we read and study the book of Genesis, 
but we also will enjoy its beautiful stories and learn to walk better with the Lord of creation, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Meanwhile, the geographical movements of the book from Eden to Babel, to the Promised Land, to Egypt, to the prospect of the Promised Land, remind us of our nomadic journeys and nurture our hope for the real promised land, the new heaven and the new earth. As we follow the various characters across the pages of Genesis, we will discover that, regardless of how different the times, place, culture and circumstances, often their stories are, in many ways, ours as well. Sabbath afternoon, March 26. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you as we listen to your word, as we read your word, as we try to understand your word. And this week we're starting in the very first word of the first chapter of the first book of Genesis in your word. We pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us. May we see what you are like and what you want for us. But most of all, we want to thank you that regardless of the outcome of the stories in Genesis, that you are the one who oversees all, that you were faithful, and that Jesus came, that each of us could survive into the future. Bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Let's read that again, Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The book of Genesis, and hence the whole Bible, begins with God's acts of creation. This fact is very important because it means that our creation marks the beginning of human and biblical history. This truth also implies that the Genesis creation story has the same historical veracity as other events of human and biblical history. The two creation texts in Genesis chapters 1 and 2 contain lessons about God and humanity. As we study this week, we will understand better the profound meaning of the seventh-day Sabbath. We will ponder God's act of creating humans in His image and out of the dust too. We will be intrigued by the purpose of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and by its connection with the tree of life. The most important lesson of the biblical stories of the beginning is a lesson on grace. Our existence is purely an act of grace. God created the heavens and the earth while humans were not yet present. Just as our creation was, our redemption is too a gift from God. And how profound it is that both concepts, creation and redemption, exist in the Seventh-day Sabbath commandment. Sunday, March 27, The God of Creation Read Psalm 100, verses 1 to 3. What is the human response to the God of creation, and why? Psalm 100, beginning at verse 1. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God, and it is he who has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. In Genesis chapter 1, the first message of the creation account is God. We hear it in the translation, in the beginning God, in Genesis 1 verse 1. In the first line, Genesis 1 verse 1, the word God is placed in the middle of the verse and is underlined by the strongest accent in the Hebrew liturgical traditional chanting in order to emphasize the importance of God. 
The creation text begins, then, with an emphasis on God, the author of creation. The book of Genesis begins, in fact, with two different presentations of God. The first creation account in Genesis 1, verse 1, through to chapter 2, verse 4, presents God as infinitely far from humans, the transcendent God, Elohim, whose name speaks of the supremacy of God. The name Elohim denotes preeminence and strength, and the use of the plural form of the word Elohim expresses the idea of majesty and transcendence. The second creation account in Genesis 2, verses 4 to 25, presents God as up close and personal, the imminent God, Yahweh, whose name many believe denotes closeness and relationship. The creation text as a whole is then an implicit appeal to worship God, first to be aware of God's infinite grandeur and power, and at the same time to acknowledge our dependence on him because he created us and not we ourselves, as it says in Psalm 100 verse 3. This is why many of the Psalms often associate worship with creation, as we read in Psalm 95, verses 1 to 6, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms, for the Lord is the great God and the great King above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. And in Psalm 139, verses 13 and 14, For you formed my inward parts, you covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvellous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. And we'll compare that with Revelation 14, verse 7. Saying with a loud voice, Fear God, and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. This twofold view of a God who is both majestic and powerful, and who also is close, loving, and in a relationship with us, makes an important point about how we should approach God in worship. Awe and reverence go along with joy and the assurance of God's proximity, forgiveness and love. As we read in Psalm 2 verse 11, Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Even the sequence of the two presentations of God is meaningful. The experience of God's proximity and the intimacy of his presence follows the experience of God's distance. Only when we have realized that God is great shall we be able to appreciate his grace and enjoy in trembling his wonderful and loving presence in our lives. And so to finish today... Think about the vast power of God, who upholds the cosmos, and yet can be so near to each of us. Why is this amazing truth so amazing? Monday, March 28, The Creation Read Genesis chapter 1, verse 4, 10, 12, 18, 21, 25, and 31, and Genesis 2, verses 1 to 3. What is the significance of the refrain, It was good, in the first creation account? What is the implied lesson contained in the conclusion of creation in Genesis 2, verses 1 to 3? First of all, Genesis 1 verse 4, And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And verse 10, And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. 
and verse 12, And the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And verse 18, And to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And verse 21, So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves, with which the water abounded, according to their kind, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And verse 25, And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And verse 31, Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. And chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. At each step of the creation account, God evaluates his work as tov, or good. It is generally understood that this adjective tov means that God's work of creation was successful, and that God's observation that it was good means that it worked. The light was illuminating in Genesis 1 verse 4, the plants were yielding fruit in verse 12, and so forth. But this word referred to more than the efficacy of a function. The Hebrew word tov also is used in the Bible to express an ascetic appreciation of something beautiful, as you read in Genesis 24 and verse 16. Now the young woman was very beautiful to behold, a virgin. No man had known her, and she went down to the well, filled her pitcher, and came up. It is also used in contrast to evil, as we read in Genesis 2 and verse 9, And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is associated with death, we read in 2.17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. The phrase, it was good, means that the creation was working nicely, that it was beautiful and perfect, and that there was no evil in it. The world was not yet like our world, affected by sin and death, an idea affirmed in the introduction to the second creation account in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 5. Before any plant of the field was in the earth, and before any herb of the field had grown, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth, and there was no man to till the ground. This description of the creation radically contradicts the theories of evolution, which dogmatically declares that the world shaped itself progressively through a succession of accidental happenings, starting from an inferior condition and progressing to a superior one. In contrast, the biblical author affirms that God intentionally and suddenly created the world in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There was nothing happenstance or chancy about any of it. The world did not come about by itself, but only as a result of God's will and word. As you read in verse 3, Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. The verb bara, or create, translates in Genesis 1 as in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, occurs only with God as its subject, and it denotes abruptness. God spoke, and it was so. The creation text informs us that everything had been done then. Genesis 1 verse 31, Then God saw everything he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. And according to the Creator himself, it was all judged very good. 
Genesis 1.1 states the event itself, the creation of heaven and earth, and Genesis 2.1 declares that the event was finished and it was all completed, including the Sabbath, in seven days. And so to finish the day, why does the idea of billions of years of evolution completely nullify the Genesis creation story? Why are the two views incompatible in every way? Tuesday, March 29, The Sabbath Read Genesis chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, and Exodus 20, verses 8 to 11. Why is the seventh-day Sabbath related to creation? How does this connection impact how we keep the Sabbath? Genesis 2, beginning at verse 2, And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. And Exodus chapter 20, beginning at verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labour and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and hallowed it. It is precisely because God ended his works of creation that he instituted the Sabbath. The seventh-day Sabbath is therefore the expression of our faith that God finished his work then, and that he found it very good. To keep the Sabbath is to join with God in the recognition of the value and beauty of his creation. We can rest from our works just as God had rested from his. Sabbath-keeping means saying yes to God's very good creation, which includes our physical bodies. Contrary to some ancient and modern beliefs, nothing in Scripture, Old or New Testament, denigrates the body as evil. That's a pagan concept, not a biblical one. Instead, Sabbath-keepers are grateful for God's creation, which includes their own flesh, and that is why they can enjoy the creation and why they take care of it. The Sabbath, which marks the first end of human history, also is a sign of hope for suffering mankind and for the groaning of the world. It is interesting that the phrase finished the work, reappears at the end of the construction of the sanctuary in Exodus chapter 40, verse 33. And he raised up the court all around the tabernacle and the altar and hung up the screen of the court gate. So Moses finished the work. And again, at the end of the building of Solomon's temple, 1 Kings chapter 7, verses 40. To 51. Huram made the lavers and the shovels and the bowls, so Huram finished doing all the work that he was to do for King Solomon for the house of the Lord. So all the work that King Solomon had done for the house of the Lord was finished, and Solomon brought in the things which his father David had dedicated, the silver and the gold and the furnishings. He put them in the treasuries of the house of the Lord. Both places where the lesson of the gospel and salvation had been taught. After the fall, the Sabbath at the end of the week points to the miracle of salvation, which will take place only through the miracle of a new creation, as you read in Isaiah 65 verse 17, which reads, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. And in Revelation 21 verse 1, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea.
The Sabbath is a sign at the end of our human week that the sufferings and trials of this world will have an end as well. This is why Jesus chose the Sabbath as the most appropriate day to heal the sick, as you read in Luke 13, verses 13 to 16. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation, because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. And he said to the crowd, There are six days on which men ought to work, therefore come and be healed on them, and not on the Sabbath day. The Lord then answered him and said, Hypocrite, does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it away to water it? So ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, think of it for eighteen years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath? Contrary to whatever traditions the leaders were stuck in, by the Sabbath healings Jesus pointed the people and us, to the time when all pain, all suffering, all death will be over, which is the ultimate conclusion to the salvation process. Hence, each Sabbath points us to the hope of redemption. And so to finish the day, by resting on the Sabbath day, how are we experiencing the rest and salvation that we have in Jesus now, and that which will be fulfilled ultimately in the creation of the new heaven and the new earth? Wednesday, March 30. The Creation of Humanity The creation of humans is God's last act of creation, at least in the Genesis account. Humans are the culmination of the whole earthly creation, the purpose for which the earth was made. Read Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 29, and chapter 2, verse 7. What is the connection between these two different versions in regard to the creation of humanity? Genesis 1, beginning at verse 26, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. And Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. That God has created humans in His image is one of the boldest statements of the Bible. Only humans have been created in the image of God, though, as it says in one twenty-five, God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, and in chapter 1 verse 27, God created man in His own image. This formula has often been limited to the spiritual nature of humans, which is interpreted to mean that the image of God is understood to signify only the administrative function of representing God, or the spiritual function of relationship with God or with each other. While these understandings are correct, they fail to include the important physical reality of this creation. Both dimensions are indeed included in the two words image and likeness, describing this process in Genesis 1.26. While the Hebrew word tselem, T-S-E-L-E-M, 
or image, refers to the concrete shape of the physical body, the word demut, D-E-M-U-T, likeness, refers to abstract qualities that are comparable to the divine person. Therefore, the Hebrew nation of the image of God should be understood in the holistic sense of the biblical view of human nature. The biblical text affirms that human individuals, men and women, have been created in God's image physically as well as spiritually. As Ellen G. White clearly comments in Education, page 15, when Adam came from the Creator's hand, he bore in his physical, mental and spiritual nature a likeness to his Maker. In fact, this holistic understanding of the image of God, including the physical body, is reaffirmed in the other creation account, which says that man became a living being in Genesis 2.7, literally a living soul, nephesh, N-E-F-E-S-H, as the result of two divine operations, God formed and God breathed. Note that the breath often refers to the spiritual dimension, but it also is closely tied to the biological capacity for breathing, the part of the man that was formed of the dust of the ground. It is the breath of life, that is, breath, spiritual, and life, physical. God will later perform a third operation, this time to create the woman from the body of the man in Genesis 2, 21-22, a way to emphasise that she is of the same nature as the man. And that reads Genesis 2, beginning at verse 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs, and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. Thursday, March 31. The Duty of Humanity As soon as God created the first man, he offered him three gifts. The Garden of Eden, in verse 8, food, in verse 16, and the woman, in verse 22 of chapter 2. Read Genesis 2, 15-17. What is man's duty toward creation and toward God? How do these two duties relate to each other? Genesis 2, beginning at verse 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die." The first duty of man concerns the natural environment in which God has put him, to tend and keep it, we read in verse 15 of chapter 2. The verb avad, A-V-A-D, which means tend, refers to work. It is not enough to receive a gift. We have to work on it and to make it fruitful, a lesson that Jesus will repeat in his parable of the talents in Matthew 25. The verb shamar, S-H-A-M-A-R, keep, implies the responsibility to preserve what has been received. The second duty concerns his food. We have to remember that God gave it to humans, as you read in Genesis 1.29, And God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed. To you it shall be for food. God also said to Adam that you may freely eat in Genesis 2.16. Humans didn't create the trees or the food on them. They were a gift, a gift of grace. But there is a commandment here as well. They were to receive and enjoy God's generous gift of every tree, 
As a part of this grace, though, God added a restriction. They should not eat from one particular tree. Enjoying without any restrictions will lead to death. This principle was right in the Garden of Eden, and in many ways that same principle exists today. The third duty of man concerns the woman. God's third gift, man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, Genesis 2.24. This extraordinary statement is a powerful expression that highlights human responsibility toward the conjugal covenant and the purpose of being one flesh, meaning one person. And we compare this with Matthew 19, verses 7 to 9. They said to him, Why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? He said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery, and whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. The reason it is the man and not the woman who should leave his parents may have to do with the biblical generic use of the masculine. Hence, perhaps, the commandment applies to the woman too. Either way, the bond of marriage, though a gift from God, entails human responsibility once the gift has been received, a responsibility that rests with both the man and the woman to fulfil it faithfully. And so to finish the day, think about all that you have been given by God. What are your responsibilities with what you have been given? Friday, April 1. From the book Education, page 128 and 129, written by Ellen G. White, we read, Since the book of nature and the book of revelation bear the impress of the same master mind, they cannot but speak in harmony. By different methods and in different languages, they witness to the same great truths. Science is ever discovering new wonders, but she brings from her research nothing that, rightly understood, conflicts with divine revelation. The book of nature and the written word shed light upon each other. They make us acquainted with God by teaching us something of the laws through which He works. Inferences erroneously drawn from facts observed in nature have, however, led to supposed conflict between science and revelation, and in the effort to restore harmony, interpretations of Scripture have been adopted that undermine and destroy the force of the Word of God. Geology has been thought to contradict the literal interpretation of the Mosaic record of the creation. Millions of years, it is claimed, were required for the evolution of the earth from chaos, and in order to accommodate the Bible to this supposed revelation of science, the days of creation are assumed to have been vast, indefinite periods covering thousands or even millions of years. Such a conclusion is wholly uncalled for. The Bible record is in harmony with itself and with the teaching of nature. End of quote. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. 1. Why would the quality of our faith be affected if we believed that these stories of the beginnings were legends, myths, essentially designed to instruct us in spiritual lessons, but without historical reality? What clues in the biblical text suggest that the biblical author knew that they were historical, just as the rest of the stories in the book of Genesis are? What is Jesus' testimony about the historical truth of these stories? 2. What does the Genesis story teach us about the importance of stewardship of the earth? How can we be good stewards of our planet while, at the same time, avoiding the danger of all but worshipping the creation itself, as opposed to the Creator, 
which is a very real temptation, as we read in Romans 1.25, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed for ever. Amen. And three, despite the ravages of sin over the long millennia, in what ways does the original wonder and beauty and majesty of the very good creation still manifest itself to us, speaking to us in powerful ways of God's goodness and might. Inside Story Our mission story this week is titled Mocked for the Sabbath and it's by Andrew McChesney. Students mocked Lisa Samilla Yassin for skipping classes on Saturdays in Mozambique. You came here to this university to study, not to follow your church's teachings, said one. You're crazy, said another. It all began when Lisa was struggling with her mechanical engineering studies during her first semester at a public university, and she found relief listening to music shared by a Seventh-day Adventist classmate, Belisario. Then she and Belisario began to study the Bible together. Lisa had other new friends, and they also studied the Bible. The more she studied, the more she felt confused. The two Bible studies didn't agree about the Sabbath. She quit both to search the Bible for herself. Prayerfully, she read the fourth commandment in Exodus 20, verses 8 to 11, which begins, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. She read the Lord's call in Isaiah 58, 13, To turn away from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, and Jesus' words, If you love me, keep my commandments. She decided to keep the Sabbath. At first, Lisa hid her decision. She was afraid of being ridiculed, and she didn't want to ask teachers to be excused from Saturday classes. She also worried about what her parents would say. However, she couldn't keep her convictions to herself for long, and she announced at the end of the second semester that she would become an Adventist. Her worst fears materialised. Former friends taunted her, and when they saw her walking with Belisario, sneered, Oh, those Adventists! Teachers refused to reschedule Saturday classes, and her grades dropped. If you don't like it here, just leave, teachers said. Her mother was furious, and her father disowned her. Then Lisa met a visiting student from Mozambique Adventist University at her church on Sabbath. She was excited to learn about an Adventist university in Mozambique, and she begged her mother to allow her to transfer. Her mother initially refused, but unexpectedly changed her mind after Lisa, like Queen Esther, prayed and fasted for three days for God to intervene. A short time after changing universities, she told her mother that she no longer needed help with expenses. Her new library job covered her costs. Her mother was astonished. Indeed, the Lord is not your stepfather, but your real father, she said. Losa, 22, a photograph shown here, now a second-year nutrition major, plans to become a missionary in Mozambique, where malnutrition is a serious problem. Part of the 13th Sabbath offering three years ago helped Mozambique Adventist University expand its nutrition department with new classrooms and equipment. This lesson was read by Dr Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. Remember, God is always faithful.